All right, now um, keep your finger here in Leviticus 25. We're going to flip real quick to Exodus 22. In Leviticus 25, we see it's a, it's a real long chapter, and it deals with mostly with the year of Jubilee and um, with people's the, the possession of the land. And if you sell the land, or if you sell yourself, if you you know if you fall on hard times, you don't have any money, and you need you need to survive. Obviously, one of the things that people would sell if you don't have anything is yourself. You'd sell your labor. You become a servant to somebody else for a certain number of years. And what this is describing here in this land of jubilee, my sermon is not about the land of jubilee. I just want to, or the, the land, the, the, the year of jubilee. It's not about the year of jubilee, but it's just kind of important to understand this concept because it's going to go hand in hand with what I'm preaching about tonight. The year of jubilee, I mean, God's plan and God's, um, the way he had set up human government, everything that he designed was the best way for man to, to do things. And we live in a society today where there is um, there's kind of a growing disparity between those that have wealth and those that don't have wealth. We, we see a lot of power being, being consumed and, and being aggregated into the hands of a very few number of people. And um, you know, there's a lot of people that, that say, oh, capitalism is a problem. And no, it's not capitalism. There's a lot of things that are, that are wrong. It's when people start using the government and oppressing people and using these laws against them to gain all of this wealth. And people are amassing lots and lots of wealth and, and also lots and lots of power into their hands and that's not the way that God designed it. One of the, the, the barriers against this happening that God designed was this year of Jubilee where God gave a possession unto people, unto the children of Israel. They all had their own possessions. He designed their borders. He says, this is where you're going to stay. This is where you're going to stay. And these people had that land and it was their possession. But you notice in this chapter, I don't remember which specific verse it was, he was saying the land is the Lord's. Okay, God owns that land, and he was just basically letting them stay on it. He said, okay, this is going to be your inheritance. This is where you're going to stay. And it was allowed for them to sell their land, but it was temporary. It was not going to stay. So, so you couldn't have somebody come up that, you know, started gaining more and more wealth. Maybe they started becoming successful, and then they started buying up all this land so that ultimately they would be the ones that just owned the whole land, and then everybody would be servants unto them because they, they owned all the land. And God prevented this from happening so that people couldn't gain that much power and that much wealth by saying, well, no, every 50 years, there's a year of Jubilee. So if you sold your land unto someone, hey, that inheritance is going back to you. God's going to make sure that, that you get that land that's still going to come back to you. And, you know, they had this economy that, that was all based off of that. So people knew that when you're going to sell a land, if the year of Jubilee is coming up in just like three or four years, that land's not going to be worth as much to you because you're only going to have it for a few years so you don't get as much value for that. And, and, and you know, this whole chapter, and there's other chapters as well that kind of deal with this concept, but it's important to understand that, that God designed this system so that there wouldn't be this, you know, this, this elite of just one or two or a few people that have all this wealth and all this power to be able to oppress the people. And what we're going to be dealing more is that is with that oppression and that oppression of usury. Now, if you don't know what that word usury means, basically what it is, it's, it's charging interest for some, for, on somebody for borrowing, right? So when um, you think about the, the most common example is your credit card. If you, if you have a credit card, you go out, and basically what that is, it's somebody lending you money you know, to, to make a purchase, to buy something. You don't have the money. You're at, you're, essentially, you're asking them to pay for you, so they pay it for you, but then... They're going to start charging you extra money on top of what you already borrowed. So you borrow $100 and you say, well, I don't have $100 right now. I need to borrow. So I'm going to put it, I'm going to charge it on my card. Someone else paid that for you. But now they say, okay, every month that you don't pay me, if, if it's not paid in full, you're going to start owing me more and more money. You're going to have to pay you know, a certain percentage, right? Let's just say 10% to keep it easy, right? Um, and there's... I don't want to get into all the, the ways that they calculate percentages, but basically, you know, if you, you say in a year's time, you're going to owe me $110 instead of $100. That's what you're going to owe me for give, just for lending you this money. And we're going to see that this is unjust and, and that we shouldn't be doing this. But we're going to read a lot of scripture about this and kind of go into detail about usury. Um, turn, if, you, if you're in Exodus 22, keep your finger there in, in Leviticus 25 because we're coming right back to that. But in Exodus chapter 22... 
Look at verse number 22. The Bible says, Ye shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. Now, I want you to notice, pay attention as we read the scripture. We go through a lot of scriptures on usury. Pay attention to the use of these words like affliction and oppression because that's what ultimately what usury is and what it's doing is, you're, is people oppressing the poor. People who don't already have money to begin with, that they're, that they're looking for, for people for help to borrow some stuff and they're being oppressed even further because they're not just getting help with that money they're getting charged even more for that. So it, it, it brings you down and key, is designed to keep you low and to keep you oppressed. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 23, it says, If thou afflict them in any wise, and they cry at all unto me, I will surely hear their cry, and my wrath shall wax hot, and I will kill you with the sword, and your wives shall be widows, and your children fatherless. If thou lend money to any of my people that is poor by thee, thou shalt not be to him as an usurer, Neither shalt thou lay upon him usury. If thou at all take thy neighbor's raiment to pledge, thou shalt deliver it unto him by that the sun goeth down, for that is his covering only. It is his raiment for his skin, wherein shall he sleep. And it shall come to pass when he crieth unto me that I will hear, for I am gracious. So we see here right in Exodus 22, 25, that if you lend money unto people, if someone asks you, hey, hey I, I, need, I need to borrow some money. Can, can, I, can you borrow me some money? Can you lend me, sorry, excuse me, can you lend me some money? I need to borrow some money. Will you lend me some money? If you say, okay, I'm going to lend you some money, but it's going to come at a price. That's usury. And that's wicked. That is a wicked sin. See, we live in a society today where, where almost everything is based upon credit and, and upon usury. It's become so commonplace, I think people just forget that, hey, this is a wicked sin. You ought not to be involved in this. Now, we don't want to be on the receiving end of this. We also don't want to, definitely don't want to be on the other end where, where we're charging other people usually. Now, I don't think that the people in this room tonight are probably going to have to, you know, I, I'm not too concerned that you're out charging other people usually. But maybe one day you will. Maybe you'll be blessed. You have a lot of money. And because the way of the world, this is how things are done, it might just seem normal for you to say, oh, yeah, well, I've got some money and, you know, the credit card charges me and everyone else is doing this. So, sure, it makes sense. I'm, I'll give you a 4% you know, a loan. You want money from me? Yeah, it's, I'll, I'll, and I'll do you a favor. I'll, it'll be real cheap. It'll only be a few percent. I won't charge you as much as the bank will. And you're thinking you're doing a favor when really you're sinning against God. And you're oppressing that person that needs help. Now look, if you're going to lend money to someone because you have it, great. Amen. Do that. And if you, and if you can't do it, then don't. You know, but don't think, hey, I'm going to start, I'm going to make a little bit extra money for myself off of this person who's in need. That's oppression. Let's flip back to Leviticus uh, 25. Verse number 13 is explaining a little bit about the year of Jubilee. It says, In the year of this Jubilee you shall return every man unto his possession. And if thou sell aught unto thy neighbor, or buyest aught of thy neighbor's hand, ye shall not oppress one another. Again, we're, we're looking at oppression here. Verse 15, According to the number of years after Jubilee thou shalt buy of thy neighbor, and according unto the number of years of the fruits he shall sell unto thee. According to the multitude of years thou shalt increase the price thereof, and according to the fewness of years thou shalt diminish the price of it. For according to the number of the years of the fruits doth he sell unto thee. Verse 17, Ye shall not therefore oppress one another, but thou shalt fear thy God, for I am the Lord your God. Jump down to verse number 33. The Bible says, And if a man purchase of the Levites, then the house that was sold and the city of his possession shall go out in the year of Jubilee, and the houses of the cities of the Levites are their possession among the children of Israel. But the field of the suburbs of their cities may not be sold, for it is their per perpetual possession. Verse 35, And if thy brother be waxen poor and fallen in decay with thee, then thou shalt relieve him. Yea, though he be a stranger or a sojourner, that he may live with thee. So this is telling us right here is a commandment. Say, look, if your brother is getting poor, if he's waxing poor, if he's falling on hard times, hey, he's going through a time of need. He's got some problems falling in decay with thee. He says, then thou shalt relieve him. Relieve his affliction. Relieve that by, by helping him out. Help him out financially. Whatever his need may be. Hey, be a brother to that person. Help them out. He says that hey, he may live with thee. Verse 36 says, Take thou no usury of him or increase, but fear thy God that thy brother may live with thee. God's saying, look, you better not do this. You better fear me. 
Because God's going to bring judgment on you if you decide to oppress that poor and say, oh, yeah, I'll help you out. But like I said, it's going to come at a price. Yeah, yeah I'll give you out. Sure, you need, you need some money? Okay. Well, I'm going to charge you interest on that. That's wickedness, and God's going to judge you for that if you decide to be a part of that. Verse number 37 says, Thou shalt not give him thy money upon usury, nor lend him thy victuals for increase. Now, victuals is like your food. All right, someone's, someone's poor, they need money, or maybe they just need some food. You know, whatever it is, and that's what it says. Um, now, we'll get there in a minute. But whatever it is that, that you can lend to somebody where you're going to be charging them something back as a fee... He said, that's wicked. Don't do that. Whether it's food, whether it's money. He says in verse 38, I am the Lord your God, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. See, the people of Israel need to remember that they were in bondage. They were oppressed. They were in the land of Egypt. And God freed them from their bondage and from their servitude and from their oppression that was, that was being you know, forced on them in Egypt that they should now in turn, now that they're free, now that they're free from that bondage, turn that around onto their own people. And if you think about it, you know, in a way, in, in another sense, we've all, we were all in bondage to sin and um, God delivered us from that bondage. We shouldn't be looking to keep anybody else in bondage, just, just in general. I mean, it's not good to just keep people in bondage, right? We want the whole, the gospel is about freedom, we're, the whole message is about keeping people free, so we don't want to oppress um, people, especially their brethren, um, by keeping them in bondage in any way, whether, whether it's through sin or not. Um, specifically, we're talking about just lending money and things. Verse 39, let's keep reading here in Leviticus 25, says, And if thy brother that dwelleth by thee be waxen poor and be sold unto thee, thou shalt not compel him to serve as a bondservant, but as an hired servant and as a sojourner, he shall be with thee and shall serve thee unto the year of Jubilee. This is drawing a difference between someone who's a bond servant and a hired servant, right? So if someone comes and they, they're like, look, I really need to, I, I'm in a bad shape and, and I'll work for you, right? And they're basically selling themselves to, to be able to, um, you know, to work, to, to do things. And they're saying, don't treat them like he's your slave. Don't treat him like a bond servant let, that you own them as property. Because again, in these days, that's what happened. People would sell themselves and become somebody else's property to be used as they saw fit when, when they fall on hard times because there wasn't much else to do. There wasn't much choice when you don't have anything. You don't have any land. You don't have any goods. What do you have left but yourself and your own hard work? And if you, if you can't find anyone to hire you, and that's what he's saying here, look, if someone gets to that point and they come to you and they're saying, you know what, I'm going to sell myself to you and I'm going to be your bond servant. He says, don't treat him like a bond servant. He says, treat him like a hired servant. And um, it says in verse 40, but as an hired servant and as a sojourner, he shall be with thee and shall serve thee unto the year of Jubilee. And see, in the year of Jubilee, they're going free, no matter what. I mean, if they're, if they're in that spot, they are not going to be kept in bondage anymore. I mean, even if they sell themselves, but they voluntarily are selling themselves, the year of Jubilee, they're going free. Verse number 41, it says, And then shall he depart from thee, both he and his children with him, and shall return unto his own family, and unto the possession of his fathers shall he return. For they are my servants, which I brought forth out of the land of Egypt. They shall not be sold as bondmen. So God's saying, look, they're my servants, right? They belong unto God. And, and this is why he's saying they're going to go free. I brought them forth out of Egypt. They're not going to be sold as bombing. Um, it's interesting, though, though, there is, and I don't want to get into this too much, but, but you'll see if we continue reading in verse 43, God did make an exception for the heathen of the land that were round about him. And if you remember, the children of Israel were supposed to destroy out of the land the heathen that dwelt in that land. And because God was bringing his judgment upon that nation. And it's not a pleasant thing to think about what happened when they did the wars, how, the, how they were supposed to just kill everything, wipe out the, the men, the women, the children, everything. God said they are going to be destroyed from off this land. And it was because of their extreme wickedness. When you go through the book of Le Leviticus and he's given out the law and he said, 
um, that basically the heathen that were in the land before you did all of these things. And they were talking about the adultery, the sodomy, the bestiality, these, these really extremely wicked things. They said the people lived here before, they did all of these things. And that's why God had brought his judgment upon them. And that's why God's judgment was so severe, saying, look, you need to wipe these people out. But they didn't end up doing that. And God knew that. So he left this in place, though, because they still needed to be judged. And they were brought into bondage. So the, the people that, that were still left in the land, even though they, they retained their life and they weren't supposed to, it was ordained by God that they could still be kept in bondage. Okay? Um, and that's why this exception is in here in verse 43. It says, Thou shalt not rule over him with rigor, but shalt fear thy God. Again, talking about one of the brethren. It says in verse 44, Both thy bondmen and thy bondmaids, which thou shalt have, shall be of the heathen that are round about you. Of them shall ye buy bondmen and bondmaids, moreover of the children of the strangers that do sojourn among you. Of them shall ye buy, and of their families that are with you, which they begat in your land, and they shall be your possession. And ye shall take them as an inheritance for your children after you to inherit them for possession. They shall be your bondmen forever. But over your brethren, the children of Israel, ye shall not rule one over another with rigor. Um, turn, if you would, to... Deuteronomy 23. We're going to go to Deuteronomy 23 and then Nehemiah 5. We're going to go back to this concept just of, of usury. We're going to see just a few more places where it's talking about um, not lending upon usury. So 20, Deuteronomy 23 first and then we're going to jump over to Nehemiah chapter 5. In Deuteronomy 23, verse number 19, the Bible reads, Thou shalt not lend upon usury to thy brother, usury of money, usury of victuals, usury of anything that is lent upon usury. Unto a stranger thou mayest lend upon usury, but unto thy brother thou shalt not lend upon usury, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all that thou settest thine hand to in the land, whither thou goest to possess it. So again, because usury is, is, is basically a form of oppression and bondage, and here we see also unto a stranger, so unto the foreigners, people live in another land, okay, if you're going to lend unto them, you can, get, you can get usury for that because they're not part of your land. You're not, they're not God's chosen people. You're not, they're not the nation that, that God's blessing here, he says, but, but your brethren, the people within your land, you, you're not allowed to lend upon usury. And um, if you're in Nehemiah chapter 5, we're going to see this, um, a good story here, where the, where the children of Israel did start, start lending upon usury in Nehemiah chapter 5. <coughs> Nehemiah chapter 5, starting in verse number 1. The Bible reason there was a great cry of the people and of their wives against their brethren, the Jews. For there were that said, We, our sons and our daughters, are many. Therefore we take up corn for them that we may eat and live. Verse number three. Some also there, <coughs> excuse me, some also there were that said, We have mortgaged our lands, vineyards, and houses that we might buy corn because of the dearth. So there's this great famine and they're in trouble. So they're saying, look, we've mortgaged our lands, the lands that we've owned. We've gotten money for them. We got our vineyards, our houses, just so that we can eat. So they're in a time of, of, of trouble. They're in a tribe of time of despair financially. Verse number four says, there were also that said, we have borrowed money for the king's tribute. So they needed, they needed to borrow just to pay their taxes. And it says, in that upon our lands and vineyards. So they were, they were selling their lands, they were mortgaging their lands or vineyards just to be able to pay their taxes, just to be able to get some food to eat. Verse number five says, yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children is their children. And lo, we bring into bondage our sons and our daughters to be servants. And some of our daughters are brought unto bondage already. Neither is it in our power to redeem them for other men have our lands and vineyards. So basically what they're saying is that we're already now going into bondage. We're already having to sell ourselves. Our own daughters are going into bondage 
and we can't even redeem them anymore because we don't have our land. We, don't have, we have no means of making any money. We can't get out of this. And this is what happens. This bondage is just this, this downward spiral of debt of just keeping you down and making sure that you can't get out of this. And this is the oppression that comes with lending upon usury. Verse number six, we see here, and I was very angry when I heard their cry in these words. This angered Nehemiah because this is just pure wickedness. And this is happening by their own brethren. Verse number seven says, Then I consulted with myself, and I rebuked the nobles and the rulers, and said unto them, Ye exact usury every one of his brother, and I set a great assembly against him. So he goes and rebukes, and of course it's the nobles, it's the rulers, right? They're the ones that had the money. They're the ones that were in the power, and, and their brethren, their own, their own brothers and sisters, the other children of Israel they, that weren't in this position, that needed some help, they were lending upon usury and they were keeping them as bondmen and bondmaids and, um, and just keeping them down there until the point to where they're not even able to, to, to claw out of it. They're not able to pay their way back out and redeem themselves from this oppression that they've gotten into. Verse number eight says, And I said unto them, um, We after our ability have redeemed our brethren the Jews which were sold unto the heathen. And will ye even sell your brethren or shall they be sold unto us? Then held they their peace and found nothing to answer. So he's rebuking them and saying, look, we just got done being redeemed from the heathen because they were under bondage to a foreign country, to a foreign nation. It's like, we are just getting out of this bondage and now you're going to go right back as soon as we all come back out of this oppression to oppress your own brethren. And he said they, they couldn't even answer. They had nothing to say. They were ashamed. Verse number nine says, Also I said, it is not good that ye do Ought ye not to walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the heathen, our enemies? I likewise and my brethren and my servants might exact of them money and corn. I pray you, let us leave off this usury. Turn, if you would, to Psalm... Um, no, actually, turn, if you would, to Proverbs 28. We're going to be spending some more time in the book of Proverbs. Um, I'll read for you. Psalm 15, 5 says, He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent, he that doeth these things shall never be moved. And this is taught in, in context. If you know Psalm 15, he's talking about who shall abide in thy tabernacle, who shall dwell in thy holy hill. He's talking about people who are getting planted and founded and grounded in church and in the, in the house of the Lord. He's saying, um, if you don't put your money out to usury or take reward against the innocent, he says, you, you don't do these things, you're never going to be moved. You'll be solid. Um, if you're in Proverbs 28, look at verse number 8. Proverbs 28, 8 says, He that by usury and unjust gain increaseth his substance, he shall gather it for him that will pity the poor. So basically what this is saying, this is some wisdom saying that, look, if you're going to use usury, if you're going to use unjust gain against people, that's how you're going to get your wealth. Basically, God's going to take that wealth away from you. He's going to give it to someone else who pities the poor, someone who's doing the right thing. People who are living the right life the right way and they're, and they're pitying the poor and they're doing good things. He's saying, you know what? God's going to take that wealth that you extorted from people that you've unjustly got and he's going to give it back where it belongs. And he'll make sure that that happens. Um, turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter number 10. My second point here, now the first point is basically just to show you how wicked and how oppressive giving usury is and, and lending upon you. Hopefully nobody here will ever get involved with that type of a sin, with that type of oppression over other people. Um, obviously, to even to be in that position, you have to have some kind of a wealth to, to be able to, to lend unto people. And hopefully God blesses you to where, to where you do have wealth like that. But um, you know, if you don't, that's fine. But just remember, don't ever get lifted up with pride because that's what accumulating a lot of wealth will do to you. It's very easy to fall into that trap of being increased with goods and increased with riches and thinking, Forget the Lord, right? Forget who God is and forget how you got to where you're at and just start getting lifted up in your own pride because you think that you've done all this stuff and you've earned all this wealth and then that's when you start oppressing other people with, with your wealth because you get too focused on that money and you get too greedy about, about the, the money that you have. You don't want to give it out to anybody unless you're going to get something yourself. Um, just don't ever allow yourself to fall into that trap. It's a wicked sin. My second point that I want to make, though, is that we want to avoid being on the other end of that. We, want to, we don't want to be brought into bondage by anybody. We don't want to be, you know, the oppressed. 
obviously. We don't want to be the oppressor or the oppressed. We want to try to avoid that situation altogether. Um, so, you know, some of the ways that we can do this is, one, we need to be wise with our finances and what we're doing so that we don't, be, we're not forced to have to turn to someone for help that's going to, to exact usury upon us. Now, the sin is with the person who's exacting usury on you. It's not on you if you're in a time of need and the only thing that you can do is get money from someone else. Uh, the Bible does not say it's a sin for you to get money like that. Okay? Um, but it's not wise if we can avoid it. Now, I understand, again, today, you know, especially even like if you want to purchase a house and things like that, prices have gotten so expensive, you're going to do something like that, you pretty much have to um, get a loan. But um, it's still not the wisest thing. The best thing to do is to be able to buy everything with the money that you already have. That's the smartest decision that you can make is not pay any interest to anybody and not fall into that bondage. Um, again, I mean, I, I have debt that I owe and this is something that I'm, that I'm trying to preach because it's not a good position to be in. And we're going to see that from the Bible. Um, most of us experience this just through our own personal experiences. We fall into these pitfalls. But um, the Bible's got all the wisdom for us. And um, if, you, if you haven't gotten into bondage, if you haven't gotten into debt, then amen, good for you. But listen to the sermon so that you don't slip up later and, and get yourself into debt. Um, we need to make sure that we're not living outside of our means because that's one of the ways that, that when you start spending, obviously you start spending more than you have, you're going to need someone else to finance that. And that's when you're going to be brought into bondage. Proverbs 10, look at verse number 2. The Bible says, Treasures of wickedness profit nothing, but righteousness delivereth from death. The Lord will not suffer the soul of the righteous to famish, but he casteth away the substance of the wicked. He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. He that gathereth in summer is a wise son, but he that sleepeth in harvest is a son that causeth shame. Now the reason why we're reading this, these verses is just to explain to you, first of all, you know, if you're working hard, if you're going out and, and, and earning your keep and earning your way, you're not going to have to borrow from anyone else. You're not going to fall into this wickedness. Make sure that you are a hard worker. That will keep you away from, from having to be in a situation where you have to ask money from someone else. And we could, we could use this verse, look at verse number three. The Bible says, the Lord will not suffer the soul of the righteous to famish. If you're doing that which is right, if you're living according to God's ways, hey, God's not going to suffer you to famish. You are not going to go without food. You're not going to go without the things that you need. So you don't have to get super concerned and worried. And, and that's what it is oftentimes too. People get fearful. How, what am I going to eat tomorrow? What, what am I going to do? And that's when you turn to somebody to get that money and they're lending upon you on usury and they're preying upon you. Um, and, and that's just going to end up keeping you down and bringing you into bondage. We need to have that faith. And, and you know what? That's, that's a tough thing to have sometimes, especially if you don't have very much money at all. You're in a position where, where you're doing really poorly. But if you're working hard and if you're living righteously, hey, God's going to make sure that you don't go hungry. God will make sure that you are fed and that you are clothed. That is a promise from God. We're going to see that in a little bit. But the Bible's teaching here, hey, he becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand. If you're not diligent about your business, if you're not going out and working hard, you're going to become poor. Okay? And becoming poor is going to lead you possibly down that path of, of getting into borrowing upon usury. It says, But the hand of the diligent maketh rich. He that gathereth in the summer is a wise son, but he that sleepeth in harvest is a son that causeth shame. Don't be lazy. Don't be just all about, oh, I'm tired, I don't want to go out to work today. You know, whatever it may be. You need to work hard. Um, the Bible says in Proverbs 19.15, Slothfulness casteth into a deep sleep, and an idle soul shall suffer hunger. So if you're, you know, God's promise to, to, to do stuff for, you know, to, to take care of you, to feed you, clothe you, if you're living righteously, if you're doing that which is right, if you're keeping yourself busy, but if you're just idle, if you're just hanging out at home, if you're just hanging, you know, God's not promising to take care of you. He's saying, look, you're going to go hungry. If you're not going out and, and finding work for yourself and, and doing what you need to do to support yourself, to support your family, God could cause you to suffer hunger. You, you will suffer hunger. That's just the way it works. Um, turn, if you would, to Haggai chapter 1. Haggai chapter 1. So, 
we want to avoid being brought into bondage, right? We need to be wise with how we spend our money. We need to be hard workers. We need to be going out and working as hard as we can. Look, God will look on it. God will bless you. If you're, and, and I don't care what you, what you do, what job you have. There's Any job you have today is going to allow you to be able to feed yourself. And to clothe yourself so that you don't... It, it's When we get into bondage, when we get into usury, when we get into to debt with other people, it's because we want certain things that we don't have. And that's when, we, when you end up making mistakes of getting into bondage where you owe other people. But even the, the, the minimum wage jobs, some of the lowest jobs that you can get, will be enough to support yourself with food, and with clothing, and, and that, that ought to be enough. We ought to be content with the things that we have. It's when we start looking on other things and lusting after them, especially stuff that we, don't have, we can't afford, is when we're going to get into trouble with, with getting into debt that, that we're just simply not able to, to pay and that, that'll bring us into bondage. But um, the best way, I, I believe, to help your finances out is to get right with God. To, to be in this right position because... Even if you've already screwed up, okay, if, you've, if you already have a mess, be like, man, I didn't know what I was doing. I made a lot of mistakes. Now I'm in this situation. What do I do about it? Well, one of the things you do is, again, work really hard. But even, I think even more important than that is just getting right with God and being God's servant because God will make sure that you're taken care of. You may still have to reap a little bit from, from the mistakes that you've made, but God will make sure that you're taken care of. Look at Haggai chapter 1 and verse number 4. Verse number four says, It is time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses. There's a, is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lie waste? He's talking about the temple. He's talking about the house of God. Verse number five, Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Ye have sown much and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. So let's say maybe this is you. You think like, man, I'm going out, I'm working, I'm working real hard, but it just seems like the money I get, I'm putting it into my pocket, my pocket's got a hole in it. So as I'm walking, my money's just gone, it's just disappearing, and I don't know what's happening. Say I'm working real hard, I'm putting in this time, I, I seem to be, you know, I, I, I know I'm making a decent wage, but where is all my money going? This is what's happening. Look what it says in verse 7. It says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways, Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house and I will take pleasure in it and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Ye looked for much and lo, it came to little. And when ye brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste and ye run every man unto his own house. Therefore, the heaven over you is stayed from dew and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I called for a drought upon the land and upon the mountains and upon the corn and upon the new wine and upon the oil and upon that which the ground bringeth forth and upon men and upon cattle and upon all the labor of the hands. God's saying right here, he says, I've caused that to happen. You know, you're looking around, you think you're working hard. Where's all my money going? God's saying, I blew on it. I'm the one that caused it to go away because they didn't have the right priority. See, they're letting the house of God in this story, they're letting the house of God just fall to shambles. They're disregarding God's house. They're not focused on what's the most important thing. They're out, they're working hard, they're trying to make money, and they're trying to do all this stuff, and God's just saying, you think you're just going to ignore me, and you're going to put me aside, and you're going to put the house of God aside, and you're just going to earn all this wealth because you're out working? God's saying, I'm going to blow on them. He's I'm going to make sure that you're not prospering. And if you're a child of God, he can do the same thing for you. You say, you know what? I, I just, I'm more interested in, in earning money. I want to have a house. I want to have cars. I want to have boats. I want to have all this stuff. And in order to do that, well, you know what? I'm going to have to just skip church on Sundays because I'm just going to be working through it. I, I don't have time for church. I don't have time for God. I'm going to just start working. I'm going to accumulate this wealth. God can make sure that... <laughs> you're putting your money into a bag full of holes. Yep. He will make sure that happens, and that's exactly what he's teaching us here. So that's why I'm saying, look, you need to work hard, yes. If you're financially struggling, yes, work hard. Look, God's going to bless you for working hard, but make sure that that is not your primary focus. Your primary focus has to be on, on serving God and serving the Lord. 
in Matthew chapter 6, verse 31, says, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? All the things that you need, right? What are we going to eat today? How am I going to dress myself? What am I going to drink? It says, For all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. That's the first thing we need to do. Yes, work hard. Yes, go out and work as hard as you can. You know, work for your, your job as if you're serving Jesus Christ. But first, seek the kingdom of God. First, make sure you're in church. First, make sure you're doing out the soul winning. First, make sure you're serving God. And then also go out and work extremely hard at your job. And, and don't be idle and don't be lazy and don't be slothful. Do all the work that needs to be done. God will bless you. If you're making sure that you're seeking God first, if you're doing what He wants you to do, He'll make sure you're not going to go hungry. He'll make sure, you know, you, you'll get those blessings that you're looking for that you need to help get you through. But you need to seek Him first. Haggai chapter 1 and Matthew 6 are both talking about the same thing. God will make sure that you don't prosper if you're not looking to Him first. Flip back, if you would, back to Deuteronomy chapter 15. Deuteronomy 15. See, we want to make sure, number one, lending on usury is evil and wicked. We should have no part of it. Um, if, if you have someone that's in need, if you have the poor, some the people that, that need some help, and you're going to help them, you do it, but you, do, you better not be charging them for you. You better not be oppressing them in that way. Number two, we, don't want, we want to make sure that we don't um, fall into that oppression, that we're not on the receiving end of that. We need to work hard. We need to seek God first. Deuteronomy 15, let's look at verse number six. The Bible reads, For the Lord thy God blesseth thee as he promised thee. And thou shalt lend unto many nations, but thou shalt not borrow. And thou shalt reign over many nations, but they shall not reign over thee. If there be among you a poor man of one of thy brethren within any of thy gates in thy land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not harden thine heart, nor shut thine hand from thy poor brother. But thou shalt open thine hand wide unto him, and thou shalt surely lend him sufficient for his need in that which he wanteth. Beware that there be not a thought in thy wicked heart, saying, The seventh year, the year of release, is at hand, and thine eye be evil against thy poor brother, and thou givest him naught. And he cry unto the Lord against thee, and it be sin unto thee. Thou shalt surely give him, and thine heart shall not be grieved when thou givest unto him. Because that for this thing the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thy works, and in all that thou puttest thine hand unto. For the poor shall never cease out of the land. Therefore I command thee, saying, Thou shalt open thine hand wide unto thy brother to thy poor and to thy needy in thy land. So the third point that I'm going to make tonight is that we need to be generous and we need to be ready and willing to help those that are in need, to help the poor, to help, to help the needy, and that we shouldn't have this wicked heart. Like here they're saying, you know, oh, the, the year of release is coming up, so I'm not going to help them out at all because... I'm not going to get much out of this and they're just going to have to be set free. You know, it said, oh, he's only going to be working for me for a little while and, and that's not even worth it to me so you don't do anything for him. He's saying that would be a wicked heart. Um, he's saying whatever your brother needs, help them with that. Um, it says in verse 11, for the poor shall, or in verse 10, sorry, thou shalt surely give him and thine heart shall not be grieved when thou givest unto him, because that for this thing the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thy works, and in all that thou puttest thine hand unto. So he's saying, look, first of all, you need to help your poor, help the needy out, help your brother, help your brother in Christ. And God's going to see that, and he's going to bless you for that. You think, oh man, but I'm struggling. Yeah, but if this person has a specific need, if they're hungry, you know, help them out. Help them out with whatever you can. Be generous. Um, turn, if you would, to Psalm 41. We're almost done. We're going to turn to Psalm 41, and we're going to go back to the book of Proverbs. We're going to wrap things up. There are major blessings for helping the poor. Now, we ought to be helping the poor because we love them, and we just want to help them out. We see them, hey, they're having a need. You know, I know what it's like to be in need. I, I think it's great to be able to help someone else out and be a blessing to them, especially those that can't even repay you. Look. Help them out when they're in need. Don't let them, don't make them have to go to someone who's going to oppress them and keep them in bondage and, and exact usury upon them. 
If you see someone that needs hate, lend to them. Give unto them. And even if you just don't expect it back in return, it's even better to say, you know what? You, 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 know, you need a couple hundred bucks or something, you're in need, you're hungry, you don't have any food, here you go. And you know, if you want them to pay you back, that's fine. Don't be charging them extra for it. Okay, here, here's a couple hundred bucks, pay me back whenever, whenever you can. Or just, just here you go, God bless you, I, you know, I, I hope, I hope you're, you do better. That's how we ought to deal with people. The Bible says in Psalm 41, look at verse number one, blessed is he that considereth the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. Look at all these great blessings in the next few verses that God's going to give you for just for considering the poor, just for helping them out in their time of need. The Lord will deliver him in, in, in time of trouble. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive, and he shall be blessed upon the earth, and thou wilt not deliver him unto the will of his enemies. The Lord will strengthen him upon the bed of languishing. Thou wilt make all his bed in his sickness. God's going to be helping you out a lot. God loves it to see his people looking out for the poor and helping out those who are in need. It's showing that pure love that you could have for somebody else, the love that God has for us. We are all in need, and especially we're in need of salvation, right? That's the number one thing that we're in desperate need of someone to save us. And God had that type of a love to give us a free gift and say, here you go. I love you. I want you to have this. We, we don't owe him anything for that. He was giving us a free gift. Now, out of love, we ought to just decide to serve himself. But, but God wants to see us have that same type of an attitude towards other people. You got people, they're poor. They're needy. They've got nothing going their way. They're being oppressed. When you can turn to that person and say, I'm going to help you out. And you expect nothing in return. God will bless you for that because God loves seeing that. God loves that you're going to help out someone who's in need, someone who's poor, someone who can do nothing for you in return. God will bless you for that. Turn, back, turn if you would, to the book of Proverbs. We're going to be in Proverbs 19. We're going to be jumping through a few different chapters here in Proverbs, and we're going to wrap it up. <clears throat> Proverbs gives us a lot of wisdom on how we, how we are to deal with the poor and with the needy. Proverbs 19, verse number 17 says, He that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord, and that which he hath given will he pay him again. This is saying, look, if you're lending unto the poor, it's as if you're giving money to God, is what he said. That's how God looks at it, saying, oh, oh, you're going to help the poor, you're going to lend unto them? God's like, that's like you're lending unto me. I'm going to make sure that I repay you for that. Even if that person's never going to be able to repay you, you're helping them out, God's going to be able to repay you for that. God sees that, and that's what we ought to be doing. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs 21. Proverbs 21, 13. Proverbs 21, 13 says, Whoso stoppeth his ears at the cry of the poor, he also shall cry himself, but shall not be heard. This is a warning saying, okay, so you, hear, you know someone's in need. You've got a brother or sister. You've got, you got one of our brethren is in need, and you decide just to stop your ears and just, just ignore it and just pretend like, you know, you have the means to help that person, but you're just going to be like, just ignore it. I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't feel like, like helping that person out. God says, okay. Oh, okay, is that how you want to be about that? When you're, when you're in time of need, when you're in of trouble, time of trouble, he says, you're not going to be heard. You're going to be crying unto me. I'm, I'm not going to hear you. You're going to have that type of an attitude with other people. We need to make sure that we're doing that, which is right. Proverbs 28, 27. Proverbs 28, 27. The Bible says, He that giveth unto the poor shall not lack, but he that hideth his eyes shall have many a curse. Again, it's explaining the same exact truth. He's saying, look, if you give unto the poor, you're not going to lack. And this goes against a lot of people's philosophy today because you think that, well, wait, if I'm giving away my goods, I'm going to lack because I'm giving away my money. I don't have it anymore. God's saying, no, it's the exact opposite. And you're saying, well, that's why I need to keep it. I need to hoard this up for myself because I want to accumulate more and more. No, you're not going to lack if you give your money to the poor. But he says, if you don't, if you hide your eyes, you're going to be cursed. And see, that's the thing. If you just rely on the wisdom of this world, you're going to think, well, the more money I give away, then the less I'm going to have. So I need to hold on to it. And God's saying, no, if you have an attitude like that, he's going to make sure that your money goes away. I mean, all it takes is just, one, one trip to the hospital 
And all that money that you're hoarding up and saving up for yourself, that's going to be gone and you're probably going to have to go into debt just, you know, just, to, just to pay off that thing. God is easily just able, just like that, to say, oh, okay, you want to just keep everything for yourself? You don't want to help out your brother in need? Here you go. Yeah. Deal with that. And, and it's a wicked attitude to have where you have, you have goods, you have things, you have the ability, the capabilities to help out your brother in need and you decide not to do that and say, no, I'm not going to do that. God will bless you for it. Proverbs 14, look at verse number 31. Proverbs 14, 31. We're almost done, a couple more verses. Proverbs 14, 31 says, He that oppresseth the poor reproacheth his maker, but he that honoreth him hath mercy on the poor. And then jump, if you would, to Proverbs 22. God's got a special place in his heart for the poor. God wants us to look out for him because the people, this, this world is all about oppressing the poor. The, the, those in power, the political elite especially, you know, they talk out of both sides of their mouth. They'll say, oh, we want to help the poor. We want to help the needy. We want to get these bad rich people. We want to take their money. We're going to give it unto you. And it's all just one big lie. The, whole, the way the government is set up right now, it's not to help the poor. See, they, they, they lie to you and they'll say, oh, we're going to help you out. The government's going to come in. We're going to help you out. You know, we're going to give you free housing. We're going to give you free health benefits. We're going to give you all this stuff because we love you and want to take care of you. And it's a lie. What they want you to do is get dependent on them and not go out and do hard work, not work for yourself, not do God's work. They want you just to... To, to be reliant completely on them so that they can keep you in bondage and they can keep you where they want you because now all of a sudden you're just relying, oh, I need my food stamps. Oh, I need my, you know, my, my welfare. I need my housing. I need all this stuff, government. So now you're going to be just controlled and oppressed by them. It sounds good on the outside. You think, oh, great. Yeah, hey, I'm in need. Thanks for helping me out, government. No, that's not their goal. They don't care about you. Yeah. They actually the exact opposite. They want to keep you in bondage and keep you um, serving them. Proverbs 22, is that where I had you turn? Proverbs 22, look at verse number 22. The Bible says, Rob not the poor because he is poor, neither oppress the afflicted in the gate, for the Lord will plead their cause and spoil the soul of those that spoiled them. As I said before, we live in a society where it's just become accepted almost that, that usury is being charged. And it really is just oppression. You think about, and this, this always drove me nuts. You think about like, um, you know, when all these late fees and stuff that you get for your bill, like you're already struggling. You're already having this, this really hard time trying to pay your bills. And then it's like, oh, your check bounced and it was late. And it's now it's like, 1500 y'all, like these, these, these bills just all rack up and it's like, I can't get out of this. There's nothing I can do. There's, there's nobody is treating you with a way, with, with mercy. It's all just oppression. And it's all designed just to, just to keep you down. Um, you know, I understand the concept of these fees and stuff, but look, we got to be able to show mercy and, and, and love the poor and give them a means and a way to be able to, to actually work themselves out of this pit instead of just keeping them down. Um, <clears throat> Matthew chapter 5 is the last place we're going to turn. Matthew chapter 5. Usury is oppression. We need, to, we need to stay far away from that. Um, don't, if you ever have the means to lend unto someone, just do it. Be a cheerful giver. God's going to bless you for it. Um, but don't exact anything of them again. Avoid, we need to avoid being brought into this bondage ourselves. Make sure that we're serving God with all of our hearts. Make sure that we're working hard in our, in our jobs, that we can support ourselves, that we're being wise with our money. We're not living beyond our means, so we're not brought into this bondage. And then the third point I had tonight was just making sure that, that we are helping out the poor. Help out your brother. Hey, some people, not all of us, maybe necessarily have gone through these hard times, but if you have, you can appreciate it. If you haven't, it doesn't matter. You still need to be helping out those that are in need, the poor, the needy. Help, help, um, help them to get back up on their feet because you never know what might happen to you one day. And even if nothing ever does happen to you, God's going to bless you for it. God's going to make sure that you're blessed and that you increase because it's as if you're lending unto God. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 39. We'll, we'll close out with this. 
The Bible says, But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law, and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. And what we can see, what, what I take away from this verse and from this passage, God doesn't care about money. We shouldn't either. It should not be that big of a deal to you. Look, someone's going to see you at the law and say, hey, here you go, take my coat too. Here you go, take it. Someone's going to, you know, someone asks you to go a mile, I'll go with you too. I'll, I'll go even further. I'll help you out. Someone asks you, I'm going to, okay, here you go. You're in need, I'll help you out. God sees that type of an attitude, that kind of, of, a, of, a, of a compassionate attitude, that type of an attitude that's, that's esteeming others better than yourself, and an attitude that it's just money. Who cares? It's not, it's not what we're here for. We are not here to accumulate the wealth and the riches of this world where moth and rust does corrupt. Amen. But we're here to accumulate treasures for ourselves in heaven where moth and rust does not corrupt and where thieves do not break forth nor steal. That should be our primary focus. Look, God will take care of the rest. The rest of it doesn't matter. Now, when you see your brother or sister in need, help them out. Look, we do use money to survive. I mean, we do need to eat food. We do need to buy clothing, right? While we're in this earth, we still need to do these things. And when people are in need, hey, help them out. That's the attitude we ought to have. And, and don't, it, it, the reason why we don't, I think the biggest reason why people don't help out is, well, I mean, if you don't have anything to give at all, then it's going to be hard to, to give. But I mean, we see the story of the, of the poor widow woman that cast in two mites. And God blessed her for that. He said, look, she cast in more than everybody. Because she had that heart. She wanted to help. She wanted to give unto God. And, and, but I think the, the most common reason why people don't is because you think, well, no, 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 I need to, I need to keep this up for myself and make sure that, that I don't ever come into need and I don't have this problem. I can't help you out because I need to just focus on myself and just make sure that I'm taken care of. And it's not the right attitude to have. Okay, now I'm not saying that you just start going into debt with everyone else just so you can help other people and give out a bunch of money. That's not what I'm saying at all. But I think you understand the point is that if you have the means, if you have anything, you could help your brother out in their need, you help him out. And God will bless you for that. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this great truth. Lord, help us to keep the right mindset about usury and about this charging of interest. It's not really called usury these days, dear Lord. Um, refer to it as interest, but... Um, I pray that you would please just, just help us to understand this concept and not to be deceived by um, people who think that they could just make money unjustly for just because of the fact that they have money. That they're just going to keep building and building more wealth upon that money by doing no actual production and no actual work. And that's just wicked, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us never to have that type of an attitude or mindset. Lord, help us to help those that are in need with whatever we can do. And God, help us not to be lazy, but that we would just, just work hard and do what needs to be done to provide for our own. And um, Lord, we know that if we just seek you first and, and, and put the word of God first in our hearts, dear Lord, and, and the service to you, that you will look out for us. You promise to do so, dear Lord. I pray that you would please just bless everyone that's here tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.